I'm really happy and excited that all of you tonight can be here to share and to sort of hear part of his story and part of things he's going to tell us. Let me just say a few words about Brother Guy so we know a little bit about his background. So Brother Guy was born in Detroit, in Michigan, and he went to college at MIT where he studied planetary science, both for his undergraduate and his master's degree, before going on to the University of Arizona in Tucson, where he did his PhD in planetary science also. He did a number of postdocs at Harvard and then back again at MIT before he spent two years in the Peace Corps overseas in Kenya, teaching physics in Kenya. On his return, he became the assistant professor at Lafayette College, and by a series of circumstances, he became a Jesuit brother. So he took some time out to become a Jesuit brother for a while and was promptly assigned to the Vatican Observatory where, after some time passed, he is now the director. So Brother Guy has had a number of different appointments in various academic institutions. There's a whole kind of list, if you look on his webpage, about where he's been. It's very impressive. Uh, but I should say that he's won several prizes for his work in planetary science and for his public outreach in planetary science. And he's also sat on several committees on the, on the I can't, I can't pronounce this word, it's the Meteorite Society. Meteoritical. The Meteoritical Society. Meteoritical. <laughs> Quite a different thing altogether. As well as for the International Astronomical Union, um, Division of Planetary Sciences, and the American Astronomical Society, Division of Planetary Sciences. And the thing which I think is most interesting at the moment is that he's also part of a committee with the International Astronomical Union that names things in space. Most specifically, he's in charge of the group that names craters on Mars. <laughs> so without, without any sort of further ado, I'd like you to give a very warm welcome to Brother Guy Consulman. And thank all of you for showing up. I saw all the seats here and I thought, you know, we're going to have 10 people. This is going to be so embarrassing. <laughs> but obviously, uh, you came to hear good stories, and I hope I will uh, provide a few. I'm going to start with um, an observing run I did about 10 years ago on Mauna Kea. And in those days, I was working closely with a fellow from the University of Oklahoma, Bill Romanishan, and another astronomer in northern Arizona, Steve Tegler. And the three of us had this observing program that were looking for patterns of colors in Kuiper Belt objects. We found a pattern, we wanted to get onto a big telescope to see if it really was true even for fainter and smaller bodies, and we got one night on the world's largest telescope, which is Mauna Kea on the top of a mountain that's at 15,000 feet, above most of the water vapor, above most of the dust, also above most of the oxygen. <laughs> In order to work there, you have to spend a week to get acclimated, and we had one night. So the way they do this is, they have a base camp. In those days, it was in a little village called Waimea. That's where we were working. Up there is where the telescopes were. And you go into a room like this, and all the, tele the, the, the computer screens match what the computers at the telescope would look like. But then you talk through a camera to the telescope operator. So we, we showed up for our one night of observing. We turn on the camera, and the operator says, we're not opening the telescope tonight. It's snowing. Oh. Oh. Or one night. Well, we drew straws. One person stayed up in case the weather cleared. It didn't. And the other two of us went to bed. The next morning, I wake up at about 6 in the morning, look at my watch, and I suddenly realize it's Sunday morning. And I'm a good Catholic boy. And the, the town of Waimea has, you know, a McDonald's next to the observatory, so you can go out and get midnight snacks. If they've got a McDonald's, they probably have a Catholic church, right? One franchise or another. So I look up, and sure enough, there's a Catholic church, Mass at 8.30. I walk over to the Catholic church. <coughs> Ascension Catholic Parish, Waimea, Hawaii. This is Hawaii. Half the people in the congregation are tourists. So the pastor before mass goes, do we have any visitors here? And anyone who's from out of town, stand up, introduce yourself. 
oh, you're from California, welcome, and, and you're from here. And everybody, one by one, says where they're from. I'm the last person. I look at the priest and I go, I'm an observer from the Vatican. <laughs> I've been waiting years! <laughs> What does it mean to be a Vatican astronomer? To give you a little bit of a, a beginning of that, I've got a short film that I want to show, just a few minutes, narrated by somebody who can do a fantastic job, far better than me. <laughs> Both science and religion are conversations about the universe. They're ways of learning how we interact with this universe. It's not simply a question of, is there a God, but there is a God, now what do we know? It's not just a question of, there are a bunch of stars, but rather, why are there stars? How do they work? How does that tell us how things work here on Earth? The interaction that I see in my own life is that religion gives me the reason to do the science. Back in the papacy before Francis was Benedict, and one of his lines in a final elocution to the fathers of the general congregation was, go to the frontiers. Well, there isn't much more frontier than 3.7 billion years away. The first uh, official interest of the church for astronomy started in 1582 with the reform of the calendar. Then in 1891, Pope Leo XIII wanted to have an observatory to show that the church is not against science, but uh, the church promotes good science. They start up by having telescopes on the Tower of Winds, and then on the walls surrounding the Vatican, as the city lights grow, and as the Italian government gives them back the territory of Castro Gandolfo, in the 30s they build new telescopes on the roof of the Papal Palace in Castro Gandolfo, the best telescopes of their era in the 1930s. By the 1980s, light pollution makes those telescopes unusable, so we build a new telescope in the dark skies of Arizona. telescopes that has been considered pretty much the norm now in, in developing telescopes. With the advance of computer technology, we have the capability of bringing that advanced technology directly into our telescope. So it's an expandable, it's almost like it's a living machine, so it can grow as uh, technology grows. It is still very important to maintain scientific research in the Vatican simply because there is still a lot of confusion about this relationship between science and faith. We are not out here trying to prove the existence of God by looking through a telescope. That's not what we're doing. But we can say that if we want to obtain any reasonable results looking through that telescope, we need to do it embracing a certain work ethics that is, in fact, the same work ethics that the Bible itself tells us through commandments and through the Gospels to embrace. Human beings look at the stars and wonder. 
They want to know what is that? What is that about? How do I fit in? They hear about the moon landing and they want to know what was that like? If we're part of the human race, we're part of the race that went to the moon. We're part of the species that looked at the stars and wondered what the heck are those things? Looking at the sky reminds you that there's more to the universe than what's for lunch. What's more? If you believe in a universe that God so loved that he sent his son, then not only are you going to want to study the universe because it's kind of cool, it's an act of worship. It's an act of getting closer to the creator and getting closer to a universe, as St. Athanasius said 1,500 years ago, was cleansed and quickened by the incarnation. Then, doing science is an act of The Vatican Observatory is actually a part of the Vatican. The Vatican's an interesting place. Um, very complicated, a lot of mysteries, you'll hear about it. The easiest way to picture it is up, you've got the Pope at the top, and then two parallel structures, the city-state on one side and the church on the other. And the Vatican Observatory itself is paid out of the funds of the city-state, most of which are the income from the museums. But I'm actually directly appointed as the director by the Pope because the observatory has been around for longer than the city state. Now, in order to help you understand the structure of the Vatican, I went online and found this very useful diagram. So the papacy is <laughs> 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 the Jesuits run everything. And under the Jesuits are the Illuminati, the international bankers, the mafia, the masons, the Opus Dei, the New Age movement. It's all in Revelation 17. <laughs> And this website is not a joke, I'm afraid. <laughs> you can find a more use of or a friendly website, but it's not actually much clearer. And I've now been the director three years and I'm still trying to figure it all out. What I do know, however, is that once a year, the Pope will invite all of the heads of the various departments at the Vatican to meet with him at Christmas time. Notice the Christmas tree off to the left and he'll read an address and greet everybody personally. You notice all the red hats and all the purple hats. The red guys are the cardinals, the purple ones are the archbishops. We have assigned seating. And way in the back, <laughs> in the very last row, that's me. But I'm in the room. And I'm happy to say that last Christmas, along with me in the room, were two women. And a whole lot of a whole lot of men still. We've uh, still got a ways to go, but we're getting there. One of the reasons that there is a Vatican Observatory is because the Vatican wants to be represented in many places in the world, including the Vatican has uh, a, 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 a uh, an observer status at the United Nations. And last year, just to give you sort of an example of the role we can play, last year was the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space Treaty and the first conference on how you, you know, the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Now in 1967, when the treaty was written, everybody happily said that, you know, all of space should be the property of all mankind because in those days, of course it was mankind, not humankind, and in those days, there were only two nations in space, so everybody else said, yeah, yeah, we get a part of that too. Fifty years later, it's a lot more complicated. Building up to the, the 50th anniversary meeting, the UN asked if they could have a workshop of key people to talk about what needs to be said at this meeting. They went to the Vatican mission in Vienna, who came to us to ask if we could host a workshop, which we did. We had 30 people. They included diplomats, representatives of various nations, uh, scholars, educators, people who are in the, the space business, in the private sector. 
And it was really interesting. I learned a lot of things I didn't recognize. Like, for instance, there are 90 nations who are members of the UN who have an official department of space of one site or another, whether it's NASA or whatever the different departments are. There are not 90 nations going into space, but there are 90 nations using the products of space. There are 90 nations that uh, say you're the Cameroon and you want to know how resources are being taken care of. You can't afford to send people up into the mountains, but you can easily afford to buy the data from a company that has a spacecraft in orbit that goes over the Cameroon. And we'll show you the illustrated you know, images in the wavelengths that will tell you how the, the material is being used. And of course, as we know, there are now a number of private companies. Who's going to write the rules of how we use space and how are we going to enforce them? One of the things that came out of this was that the enforcement occurs because people using space want there to be rules that can be enforced. If I'm starting a company and I'm going to mine an asteroid, my investors want to be assured that if you steal the mining products before I can bring them back to Earth, somebody will come after you, or else they're not going to invest in my company. If I'm taking images, there has to be a clear pattern on who has access to the images, what do I do about uh, rights, what do I do about privacy. If you're putting something in orbit, there has to be an agreement as to what orbit is safe, that you're not going to interfere with other people's orbits. It's only because there is a mutual understood need for these agreements that the agreements can even be enforced. And then, having had the meeting, they said, well, of course you're going to come to the big meeting in June. I go, I'm not a diplomat. Two months later, of course you're coming to the big meeting in time. I really don't have that kind of talent. A week before the meeting, I get a letter from the Secretary of State saying, you're going to the meeting. You're representing the Holy See. When I was in high school in Detroit, I was a member of the Model United Nations. I never thought I'd get to do the real thing. And to give you a sense of how things work in the Vatican, they gave me an eight-minute statement to read. There were 90 nations there. Everybody had somebody come up and read a statement for, for eight minutes that says, you know, science is good, space is good, peace is good. The next person gets up, science is good, space is good, peace is good. My statement said science is good, space is good, peace is good. How can you be less, you know, controversial than that? One week before this meeting, a certain U.S. American president announces a militarized force that he's going to send into space. <laughs> And suddenly, the head of the Vatican Observatory is saying controversial things against the president. <laughs> I didn't know they were going to be controversial. I didn't even, you know, write them. <laughs> of the statement that I read that I get credit for having said, there was only one phrase that actually were my words. And that was when I was quoting the Pope. And I had written that statement for the Pope some other time. So, this is the inside of how things are done in the diplomatic world. It feels like a waste of time, everybody getting up and saying the statements, but the statements have to be said. And the statements, even though when they seem obvious, aren't obvious. And sometimes you have to say the obvious. And sometimes you need to be seen saying the obvious. And it's good that there's a professional astronomer recognized by other astronomers. Uh, I mean, the poor fellow who had to represent the United States then was a fellow I knew, you know, as uh, the head of the space program at NASA. Not the head of NASA, but the, the head of the, the, pro, the uh, planetary science program. It's good to have people who are part of the community because we're a community where everybody knows everyone else. You saw the little film about our history. We were founded in 1891 in the 1930s moved out to the Pope's summer home in Castel Gandolfo. There are five domes altogether, three you can see there, and two more in the gardens. The big one was designed by Bernini, but the other ones have telescopes. <laughs> when I first arrived at the Vatican Observatory in 1993, 
we actually had our quarters, our living quarters and our offices in this building, which at the time was used as the Pope's summer home. So if you can see the red circle, the top floor is where I lived. And that was my office right there. And directly beneath me was the Pope's bedroom. <laughs> You're looking at the one guy in the Catholic Church who was above the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> My bedroom was there, and the fascinating thing was, in that courtyard, that, that open area, is where every Sunday morning, when the Pope was in residence, people would come in and hear the Pope uh, pray the Angelus, so I could see him out my bedroom window. Right. More to the point, this was in the days of Pope John Paul II, who was a wonderful Pope, but he was a young guy when he was elected, he was in his 50s, and he made a rookie mistake. And a reporter from Poland asked him, what's your favorite hymn? And he gave them the name of a Polish hymn. They opened the doors at 10. 2,000 Polish uh, pilgrims would crowd the area below my bedroom. And for two hours, I would hear that same hymn over and over again until finally at noon, the Pope came out. Uh, the Pope knew enough to stay on the other side of the building so he didn't have to hear it every day. Now, one of the great things about the Vatican Observatory and the adventures we get involved in is that we are actually part of great stories and adventures. Now, I don't know how many of you have read the Da Vinci Code or the Italian version there. We're in the Da Vinci Code. I'm in the Da Vinci Code. Eric Rosa, I have no idea if he's a good guy or the bad guy because I've only read this page of the book. <laughs> he's visiting the Vatican Observatory. A young Jesuit rushes out and meets him. Father Mangano, I figure that's Consul Magno, sort of. In I'm an astronomer here. So our hero or villain grumbles his hello, goes into the castle's foyer, a wide open space whose decor was a graceless blend of Renaissance art and astronomy images. Well, that's actually what you see. No astronomy images, no Renaissance art. In fact, those, those uh, sculptures are mid-20th century. <laughs> Following his escort up the wide travertine marble staircase, he saw signs for conference centers, science lecture halls, tourist information. There is a beautiful staircase. But it's brick, it's not travertine. <laughs> up to the wide, lushly appointed floor leading towards a huge set of oak doors with a brass sign, Biblioteca Astronomica. Well, that was the doorway. <laughs> <laughs> the Vatican's Astronomical <coughs> Library with 25,000 volumes, that's true, rare works of Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and Secchi? Secchi? Who's Secchi? <laughs> Secchi actually was a really important Jesuit astronomer of the 19th century who almost nobody has heard of. Yeah. Mostly he's showing off that he found him on the internet. <laughs> Where the Pope's highest officers hold private meetings. Well, that's what the library actually looked like. And the only meetings we held there were our summer school students, not high officials of the Vatican, I'm afraid. I want to remind you why we have an observatory. It's not so that we can have secret places to hold meetings for high Vatican officials. But as Pope Leo the said, and, and, and Pope Leo the Thirteenth said, 1891, which was just a few months from when he published Rerum Novarum, on, on the, the, the Pope's encyclical on the New World and on the industrial relations and sort of the modern Catholic social teaching. Along with modern Catholic social teaching, was a Vatican observatory so everyone can see that the church and the pastors are not opposed to science, but they embrace it, encourage it, and promote it. And when I showed up at the Vatican observatory, my, my uh, <clears throat> instructions were just do good science. And that's the same joke I was telling the last time. And this was the view out my window. This was literally the view taken not with the telephoto lens, my cell phone, <laughs> out my bedroom window. It was really an honor to be able to see the Pope's every week that close up. 
along with having regular audiences. In 2009, we moved out of there with the new pope. The building has now been turned into a museum, which I highly recommend you see. It's a beautiful museum, and the uh, 10 euros that you pay to go in there helps support the Vatican Observatory. We moved into a beautiful building that had been a, six, a 17th century convent, but the entire inside was completely remodeled. And I don't know how many of you have ever lived or worked in Italy, but it's not just that this building is air-conditioned, the other one wasn't. It's not just that uh, every Jesuit bedroom now has its own bathroom, where before we all had to share one shower. The most astonishing thing in the remodeling is that every room, lab, corridor, bedroom, has exactly the same kind of electrical outlet. <laughs> You don't have to keep looking for the adapter. Is this a two-prong or a three-prong or a thick-prong or a thin? They're all the same. Benedict XVI blessed the new headquarters of the Vatican Observatory. It's a new set of buildings about a mile from the old headquarters south of Castellan Road. The group was accompanied by the Jesuits that directed the observatory. They showed him around the new installations, telescopes, and pieces of meteorites from their collection. The Vatican Observatory changed its headquarters because it required more space to accommodate the large number of students and researchers that work there. Before, the observatory was in the summer residence of the Pope's. But for security reasons, the number of visits were limited. The new center has a conference room, more classrooms, a library, and a space for the Jesuit community that's separate from the space from students and researchers. Though a large part of the activities of the observatory are done at another center in the Arizona desert, the observatory in Castellanotolpo is still a point of reference for astronomical investigation. With their observatory, the Vatican is securing a place in the area of world astronomical research. The most astonishing thing about Benedict's visit to me was I got he, he was not in a big crowd like this, you know, a small figure far away, somebody that I actually had a chance to chat with. And his English is wonderful, far better than my Italian. And the thing that completely astonished me about Pope Benedict, the guy's got a wicked sense of humor. <laughs> he can crack jokes, he can get jokes, he asks great questions, you know, he's an academic, he understands what we're about, uh, and he listens to the answers. I was just, I was just completely astonished at uh, what a wonderful guy this guy was. A side of him you don't normally get to see. This was him uh, with our meteorite collection holding a piece of one of the meteorites that we're pretty sure comes from planet Mars. And uh, this picture occurred and it appeared on the cover, the front page of the Lazaretari Romano. And I sent a copy to my mom and I said, look, I'm on the front page, can you see me? That little bit of black there, <laughs> that's my sleeve. And I can prove it because here's another picture from the other point of view. That really was my sleeve there. At the end, the Pope went down and of course greeted each one of us uh, individually, shaking our hands. Cardinal Loyola, who was at the time the, the mayor of Vatican City, introduced each of us. He knew us very well, of course. And he made the mistake of introducing me as brother, as Father Consul Magno. And I said, uh, brother, brother. And he goes, oh, of course, my, my apologies, he knew that. But then the Pope said, well, what's that ring? My MIT ring <laughs> in Rome is often mistaken for a bishop's ring. <laughs> More than once, someone has tried to kiss it. <laughs> uh, I generally only wear it on rare occasions. Not only, of course, did Benedict come and visit, but also Pope Francis came to visit. The director of the observatory for about 10 years, Father Funes, who you saw in the last film, uh, was studying astronomy in the University in Cordoba in Argentina, thinking of being a Jesuit. Uh, as part of the process of entering the Jesuit order, you have to be interviewed by an old, older Jesuit priest. The person who did his interview was a certain Father Bergoglio. <laughs> so they knew each other going back to before they were Jesuits, before he was a Jesuit anyway. And uh, in 2013, when the Pope announced that he was no longer going to be living in Castel Gandolfo, 
And before they had the museum set up, the people in the village said, you know, if we don't have the Pope, we won't have the tourists. Please come out at least once. So he did. And after the, his visit and his audience and the town was flooded with people more than the town could handle, the mayor of Castro Gandalfa said, well, of course you'll have lunch with me. And the head of the garden said, of course you'll have lunch with me. And the Bishop of Albano said, of course you'll have lunch with me. He had lunch with us. Yeah. <laughs> Francis has continued to be a great supporter of the observatory. <clears throat> On a particular moment that I love in this picture, we had a group of Nobel Prize winners and other experts in cosmology, Roger Penrose, Peter Hooft, a number of people meeting for a five-day workshop at the Vatican Observatory with one of our astronomers who's an expert on quantum gravity. And at the end of the meeting, the Pope met everyone in the audience. I came up and offered him this book, which if you look carefully, is a children's book. This is the one that got in all the newspapers, you know, Pope holding this children's book surrounded by, by uh, the Nobel Prize winners. But the reason I gave him the book was, it was handwritten by the children of Our Lady Queen of Martyrs Great School, Beverly Hills, Michigan, 50 years after I was a student there. I'd gone back to visit, and I mean it was handwritten every page by the kids. They gave it to me to give to the Pope. And uh, I think that was my favorite moment so far of having been a director to be able to do that. I want to talk a little bit about the adventure we had in building this telescope in Arizona. We decided to build a telescope at above 10,000 feet. It's a very dark site, it's a very dry site, it's a very remote site. It's not where the telescopes in Kit Peak are. Those are only at 7,500, 8,000 feet. And it's far enough away from city lights and from available water that it'll probably stay dark for the next 50 years. But the cool thing about this telescope is the mirror. Why do astronomers use telescopes? I mean, what does a telescope get an astronomer? Makes faraway things closer? A star to the naked eye is a dot of light. A star in the world's biggest telescope is still just a dot of light. Telescopes to an astronomer don't make small things big. They make faint things bright. And you do that by having a big mirror, much bigger than the pupil of your eye, gathering as much light as possible and concentrating it to a point. How do you have that? Well, the mirror's got to be curved. How do you get a curved mirror? You can take a big slab of glass and, and grind it down and grind it down, but then you've got a big slab of glass which weighs tons. And the more you grind it, the more you're likely to cause the glass to break. About 20, 30 years ago, a fellow named Roger Angel at the University of Arizona came up with the idea of melting glass in an oven, which would then spin. And as it spins, the glass forms a parabola. The faster you spin it, the steeper the parabola. Most telescopes are good to be F9, which is to say the focal point is nine times farther away than the width. For this, his very first mirror, he said, what the heck, let's do an F1 telescope, where the light, you can see where the light focuses, it's the same distance above the telescope as the width of the mirror. Two things to note about this telescope mirror. The first of the spin cast mirrors, all the big mirrors are made this way now, but we were the test case. Roger Angel made this um, in an abandoned synagogue and then came to the Vatican Observatory and said, if you build a telescope around it, you can have the mirror, we'll share the expense, which is why we, we are now at uh, part of the University of Arizona, a state university, but the Vatican and the state share this telescope together. It does give us the chance to tell the world that the Vatican has a telescope mirror made by an angel in a synagogue. <laughs> but because I'm, I know there's probably a bunch of Brexit people here, there's a few nerds in the audience, any nerds in the audience? Okay, let me tell you some nerd stories. You all learned in freshman physics that a parabola focuses point, a light, into a single point. And that's true. Only exactly down the axis of the telescope. 
As you move away from the center of the, the field of view, the light is no longer focused into a point. It's got a, an aberration called coma. Anybody who's got a very fast Dobsonian telescope knows this. It looks like all the telescope, all the stars in the edge of your field of view look like little comets. In order to correct for that, the secondary mirror has to have not a flat shape, but a slightly curved shape. Now, if you've got a telescope where the focal point is nine times further away than the telescope would be really, really long, and it would bend under its own weight, and you'd have a terrible time keeping it in focus. The best they could do was to have the mirror halfway up. So the telescope is only half as long, and the mirror has to be curved in a convex manner. And convex mirrors are impossible to form accurately because you can't actually see the focal point. The best you can do is calculate that it's kind of close to what you want. But that's the standard that all telescopes until ours used. Because we had an F1 telescope, we could have the focal point before the secondary mirror, and the secondary mirror was concave. And you can test a concave mirror to make sure it's accurate. As a result, we have phenomenally sharp optics. For the nerds in the audience, we regularly do better than one arc second without any kind of adaptive optics. Just clear skies and sharp focus. The tighter the focus, the fainter the object you can see because all the light from that faint object gets, gets concentrated onto a few pixels of your camera. Why do I mention all this? to brag about the telescope. <laughs> this design was called the Ritchie Crichton design by the two guys who invented it. This design on the left was, uh, was a Gregorian design because a fellow named James Gregory first thought of this in England in the 1830s. <clears throat> but nobody had good enough mirrors to really test it out. <clears throat> nobody was sure that a large Gregorian telescope would work. Part of the trouble is, for the optical reasons, the position of the secondary mirror has to be precisely placed to within 10 microns, thickness of a human hair, or else the image is totally out of focus. Would we be able to do this even with our computer control? Nobody had ever done it before. But we wanted a telescope of Mr. Gregory's design. So the Vatican took a Gregorian chance. <laughs> Five minutes just for one picture. <laughs> all true, too. That's the best of it all. And it works. It works great. We, we, we do get fabulous images. I'm not the only astronomer there, not by any means. At the moment, we've got 11 researchers who come from five nations, four continents, eight languages, and that's just Paul Gabor, who's from the Czech Republic and speaks eight languages himself. <laughs> Each of us got a doctorate from a different place. Each of us came to the Vatican Observatory with a different set of, of expertise, a different set of collaborators. There is no one project that everybody works on. So you've got Rich Boyle, who works with people in Vilnius on uh, uh, stellar populations. David Brown, who's working with a group called Pepsi, which is the Potsdam something, something, something interferometer. <laughs> That is a very, very high precision uh, spectrograph. I've worked with people, as I mentioned, in Oklahoma, also with people at the, at, uh, the Natural History Museum in London. Chris Corbley has colleagues both in America and in Europe. Richard D'Souza is working at the moment at the University of Michigan. Gabriele Gionti, who is crazy three ways. He's an Italian from Naples, he's a redhead, and he's a mathematician. <laughs> but he's the guy who works on quantum gravity, uh, having decided that string theory was too easy. <laughs> Paul Gabor, who uh, is the, one, the fellow with the eight languages, and also works on uh, determining and de detecting exoplanets. Jean-Baptiste, who you saw in the film from the Congo, he's the biggest of us, and he works on dust in space. <laughs> I love it. Bob Mackey in meteoritics. Paul Muller, history and philosophy. Alessandro, who works on jellyfish galaxies. When you have two galaxies that have passed, one passed through the other, 
a string of stars can be broken off from the second one by the bigger one, and in the images they look like jellyfish. And he's the one who works out what that does to stellar populations and how that changes the evolution of the galaxies. My own expertise, my own love, my own science in this group is in the field of meteoritics. I had been a theorist before I arrived at the Vatican Observatory. I had worked out theories for how asteroids ought to evolve to produce basaltic meteorites. I had worked out theories of how a combination of rock and ice in an icy moon might melt to cause the rocks to fall to the bottom and the ice to go to the top. I remember there was a meeting of Italian scientists and after the meeting we're all gathered in a bar which in Italy means a place where you get coffee and one of the Italians started launching into a diatribe against terrorists. Terrorists, you can't trust them. Terrorists never listen to you. Terrorists think they know everything. It was five minutes before I realized he couldn't pronounce the TH. <laughs> So I was one of those terrorists. I was a theorist. And one of the things I recognized when I was making my models was that in order to make the computer model work, I needed numbers to stuff into the computer model, numbers that no one had measured. Basic numbers like the typical density and porosity of the rocky material, the density and the porosity of the meteorites. And then I was assigned to the Vatican Observatory and given one job, do good science. And I noticed that the Vatican Observatory had a collection of more than a thousand meteorites. Now, no one had ever made these measurements because no curator would give permission to an experimentalist. But I was my own curator. <laughs> I gave myself permission. How do you measure the density of a rock? You gotta know the mass, and you gotta know the volume, and the density is how much mass per volume. The mass is easy, you put it on a scale. The volume, typically they tell you in Geology 101, you drop the rock into water, and the amount of water that comes out, the volume of the water that comes out is the volume of the rock. Two obvious problems doing this with meteorites. Even I wouldn't give me permission to drop a meteorite into water because it's going to change the chemistry of these things. The other problem is meteorites are full of cracks. Do I want the volume with the cracks or without the cracks? And the answer is I want both volumes. What I don't want is a volume where the water got kind of part of into the crack, but not sure how much. I needed a fluid that would not contaminate the meteorites and not go into the cracks. And I couldn't think of such a thing but I'm working in Italy. And every day at 10 o'clock, all life stops and we have cappuccino. <laughs> and as I'm pouring sugar into the cappuccino, it hits me. Powders would act like a fluid. If I could pour sugar, well, maybe not sugar, but some kind of powder, I was talking about this with a buddy of mine back in Arizona who says, oh, oh, I've got a friend who knows a friend who knows somebody, and they've got a totally different way where, where we, we, basically, we wound up with two ways of measuring the volume. On the right, instead of uh, sugar, I use tiny glass beads that the lens makers use to polish glass. We can get a bucket of them for free. They roll because they're round. <laughs> You fill up the cup, you shake it, you scrape it, you weigh it. Dump out the beans. Put in the rock. Fill up the rest of the cup, shake it, scrape it, weigh it. The difference in the weight tells you the, the density of the rock compared to the density of the beans. And it works. But that's just the outside. If I want to know how much is rock, I need a fluid that will go into all of the pore spaces. And this gizmo on the, on the right does that. You stick in the rock, you put in the plug, you fill the one thing on the, the right with helium at two atmospheres, helium at one atmosphere on the other side with the rock in it, open the valve. As they equalize, the more rock you've got, 
the higher the final volume, the higher, higher the final pressure. The higher the final pressure, the more rock you've got. All you need is some object of known size to calibrate it, and you can read from the, from the pressures the actual volume of the rock. So you'll see in front there, we had specially purchased for us calibration spheres, numbered 1 to 15, color-coded, you know, stripes and solids. Since then, we've actually found a commercial gizmo that works fine on the smaller guys. Better than that, I found a graduate student who eventually uh, joined our group to do all the, the bead work for me. And he got tired of that, you know, it's great to have a minion working for you. <laughs> when I became the director, he took over the meteorite lab, and he replaced the beads with a gizmo that zaps things with a laser and gives you a computer image, which then you can calculate the volume. And not only that, but he's got his own minions up at the top <laughs> working for him. The latest thing we've been working on is not only the volume and the porosity, because you compare the two volumes, you know, the, the volume with the cracks, the volume without the cracks, and you know how much crack you've got, how much porosity there is in the rock, which I could talk about for hours why that's interesting, but I won't. I'll just mention one other measurement that I always wanted, which is, what is the heat capacity of a meteorite? Meteorites are these weird things made in outer space, dust from all over the origin of the solar system, sort of packed together, little bits of rock, little bits of iron, little bits of, of you know, carbonate crystals, you know, who knows what. How much energy does it take to raise the temperature of one of these things by one degree? If you're gonna measure, you know, when is an asteroid gonna melt, you need to know how much energy did I have and how much energy does it take to get to the melting point? How do you measure a heat capacity? And again, I'm a theorist, I don't know. Nobody ever told me that you can't do it. Chatting about this with a French colleague, he came up with the germ of the idea that I stole and, and happily went with. You take a bucket of liquid nitrogen. You drop the meteorite in the liquid nitrogen. Now the liquid nitrogen is slowly evaporating until you drop in the rock that it jumps up. And then it boils away the liquid nitrogen until the rock is at liquid nitrogen temperature. As the rock went from room temperature to liquid nitrogen temperature, you know how many degrees that is. And by putting this on a scale, you can measure how much liquid nitrogen got boiled away. And you know how much energy it takes to boil every gram of liquid nitrogen. So in this method, you can work out how much energy came out of the rock as it dropped in temperature, which is to say how much energy you have to put into the rock to raise it back up in temperature. Not only does this give you a measurement that doesn't hurt the rock, that's easily repeatable, that can be done in about 20 minutes, you also get to play with liquid nitrogen. <laughs> <laughs> the coolest thing going. Well, talking about meteorites being cool, one of the great adventures I had 20 years ago was to be part of an expedition to Antarctica to look for more meteorites. Antarctica is the great place to look for them for three reasons. Once a meteorite lands here on Earth, say in Pennsylvania, number one, you can't find it because it looks just like all the other rocks. Number two, the humidity in the air will attack the metal, causing the metal to rust, so about in 10 years, it turns into dust. And third, the meteorites are scattered all over the place and not very concentrated. In Antarctica, when the meteorites land on the ice, the ice carries them towards the ocean until it hits a mountain range. Then the dry winds cause the ice to sublime, leaving the meteorites behind, and you have these regions in front of the mountains that are chock full of meteorites. And the meteorites are frozen so they don't turn into mush because of water. And the meteorites are black and the ice is white so it's really easy to find them. We had a number of adventures. You see that little bit of snow on the ground there? You see that, you know, outside in Pennsylvania all the time. No. 
the ice, which looks like frozen water, like, like a frozen lake, that's what it is, has cracks. The little white stuff is a thin coating of snow over a crack. You don't dare step there. You've got to figure out some way to walk around it or jump over it. Once the meteorite is found, you uh, inspect it, somebody keeps track of what kind of meteorite it is, and then it's put into a Teflon bag and sent back to Houston where it's processed by the same people who took care of the moon rocks. And if you're a scientist who needs a meteorite, you can apply to borrow one of those meteorites. And you, you know, your, your application goes before a committee. If it's good science, you get the rock. Anyone anywhere in the world gets to use them. They're collected by uh, the National Science Foundation, processed by NASA, curated by the Smithsonian, available to the world. Among the meteorites we found my year was this guy, which is chemically identical to rocks that came from the moon. This is the world's cheapest space program. <laughs> it was also the adventure of living in a tent like that for six weeks. I, did I mention the Jesuit community that only had one shower? No shower. Um, there was a little solar panel to power a radio that we had. Once a day we would radio in to let them know we were still alive back at McMurdo. The food that we kept in that just sled out to the left, frozen food of course. And the little weather station, that was my job. Uh, wind chill got to 70 below. This was the summertime. Most of the time it was not that different from say Chicago. <laughs> you notice the bucket. We got our drinking water by chipping the ice upstream. If you went downstream, the wind always comes from the south, so you always go upwind to get your drinking water, and downwind you would see uh, little yellow patches of ice. <laughs> <laughs> and every morning, I would wake up, pull on all my clothes, my tent mate would start the fire to, to warm up the tent, I would go outside, pick up the shovel that you see off to the left, start the snowmobile, rock it a couple of times so it wasn't frozen to the ground, drive downwind to a snowbank, dig a hole, and hope I re remembered the toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> you only wanted to do that once a day. <laughs> we had a visitor who didn't know about that digging the hole problem. And after a week, we kept saying, look, it's a meteorite! And no. <laughs> was a fascinating adventure in some ways. <laughs> Living in close quarters like that, you didn't talk about politics, religion, or sex. Um, the idea of me being a Jesuit there, nobody really wanted to even bring up the topic. I was, also, I was the oldest of the gang at 45 then. And I felt sort of useless and out of place. But I also remembered the Psalm 139. Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up. You know my thoughts from far away. Boy, was I far away. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, like Antarctica, even there your hand shall lead me. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me and the light around me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day. Which reminds me, I, uh, I had bought a watch before going there with, with hands that glow in the dark. I always wanted a watch with hands that glow in the dark. And I woke up in the middle of the night, wanted to see what time it was. I kept the watch on my wrist to keep it warm. So I, but of course, I, I had no glasses, so I had to put the watch right up to my eye. I couldn't see the time. I couldn't see the hands. Nothing glowing in the dark. I was so few. I just bought the watch! And I couldn't see the hands. And then it occurred to me, I'm in Antarctica, where the sun isn't going to set until February. I'm wearing a mask. Of course I can't see the watch. <laughs> But yes, darkness is as day to you. 
the psalmist's Psalms words were literally true. I had felt hopelessly out of my depth in Antarctica. I wasn't as strong as the other guys to pick things up. I, uh, my eyesight was beginning to go, so I really needed bifocals, which meant I couldn't look at the rock close up and identify it unlike anybody else. <clears throat> everything, I mean, you're wearing these goofy, heavy clothes, and you feel like you know, you're tripping over everything. All of the skidoos, all of the snowmobiles had little images of Homer Simpson, because the thing you say over and over again, oh, because <laughs> you feel so incredibly clumsy. After the Antarctica trip, I had a chance to spend a week on vacation. Because you fly to get to Antarctica, you fly to New Zealand, and then out of Christchurch, you head south. Well, somebody had told me the place to go in New Zealand for stargazing was uh, Lake Tekapo in the South Island. I stayed in the bed and breakfast there, just by myself, sort of recovering, licking my wounds. It was a beautiful, beautiful place. And uh, I got to meet some of the other people in the bed and breakfast, family from Germany, and oh, I learned German in high school, and I was able to try out my you know, high school German a little bit, and that was kind of fun. Met the family who owned the bed and breakfast. Um, the little girl had this really thick South Island accent, and I could not understand her at all. What's your name? And she goes, hey, what, no, no, what's your name? Hey! So I asked the mother, well, what was your name? And she goes, you know, Heidi, like in the Southern Alps. And so not wanting to admit that I couldn't even understand the mom, I said, well, well, so where did the name come from? And she said, oh, from the actress, Heidi Mills. <laughs> no, right, highly. Well, that Sunday, uh, she mentioned there is a little one church in town right by the lake. One week it's Presbyterian, the next week it's Catholic, the next week it's Anglican, as the preacher comes out from Christ Church and they take turns. It's going to be the Anglican the week I was there, but you know, if you want to come along, sure. And she said, maybe you can help out with that woman you probably heard about in the papers. And I go, huh? Oh. It turns out, I hadn't realized, there was a couple from Germany, not the ones who were staying in the, in the house, but a different couple. And they were sightseeing, and he stepped back to take a picture and died, plummeted to his death in front of his wife. They're on the other side of the world from where they live. She speaks no English. And it's the weekend, she can't even get in touch with the, the consulate. They found a woman with a bed and breakfast who spoke German to at least take her in. But it's Sunday, guy, you're a Jesuit, you speak German, could you talk to her? I had spent six weeks thinking that I was a worthless Jesuit because nobody needed me. Now somebody really needed me, and boy did I feel hopeless. I had enough training to know that uh, in a case like that, really, you don't talk, you listen and I can listen in any language. And the Anglican priest helped out to you know, start a few things. But it reminded me, as an astronomer, I'm not just somebody who does science. I'm somebody. I'm a human being. And I'm called on to deal with human crises, human joys, human stories, that fill our lives. And that too is what it means to be a Vatican astronomer. That sense of the human ultimately is what connects us to the universe and what makes astronomy something proper for a Jesuit to do. Not only that studying God's universe is an act of worship of God, but the recognition that astronomy is not about stars and planets. Astronomy is about people who study stars and planets. And what's more, when we study the physical universe, we are, we are studying, in essence, ourselves, even when we study stars and planets. I go back to this wonderful phrase 
G.K. Chesterton, Orthodoxy. The essence of pantheism is that nature is our mother, but the main point of Christianity is this. Nature is not our mother, nature is our sister. Now, nature to be a solemn mother to the worshipers of Isis or Sibele, to, to Wordsworth or to Emerson, but to Saint Francis. Nature is a sister and even more, a younger sister, a little dancing sister to be laughed at as well as loved. Nature is not something to be feared. Nature is not something to dominate. Nature is our sister. We both share a common father. So why do we have a Vatican Observatory? Why does the Vatican have an astronomical observatory? For instance, you're the curator of meteorites mm -hmm. at the Vatican. Why, why do they curate meteorites? Are they looking for the shooting star of David? What, what? <laughs> no, in fact, the whole idea of having astronomers really got started with the reform of the calendar back in the 1500s. And since then, just studying the universe is a great way to remind yourself that there's more important things in life than what's for lunch. What is for lunch? <laughs> thank you all for coming, and I understand there's you know, dinner in the back there you may want to graze at. But thanks all of you. to take a few questions. Let's see, do yeah. that. And we've got the front. Front microphone, so can you... All thank right. you. Person in the front, who's okay. brave, if you're all the best students, sit in the front. <laughs> <laughs> do you have an opinion about the recent asteroid called Amuamua? The only opinion I have is it's really interesting. <laughs> and beyond that, uh, you can speculate all you want. I. There are so many things that could be besides an alien spacecraft that I'm not going to call it that. But I am reminded of a wonderful story by uh, Arthur C. Clarke called Rendezvous with Rama, which, you know, turns out it was an artifact. We actually have been expecting to see something like that for a long time. And to the astronomers looking for it, the mystery was not what was it, but how come we haven't seen one like, like that before. So it's very exciting. This is the object that came in on an orbit that is clearly parabolic. It is not an orbit stable to our solar system. So it came from some other uh, solar system, you know, the, the, the core of a comet from another set of uh, planets and stars. And since there are only 100 billion other stars within our galaxy, it's not surprising that sooner or later one would come by us. <laughs> Somebody had uh, studied 12 years ago a deep space image, I guess from Hubble, and he went back recently, last year or so, and they say it's, it's much further away than it should have been. They say the object, whatever it was, I don't know, are traveling faster than the speed of light. No, uh, that's what I heard. Well, the, the, the trouble with astronomy that you find in the newspapers is that they never tell you the boring stuff. Because that's not news. But the stuff they do tell you is the stuff we don't know yet. And 50% of what you're going to read is wrong. But I can't tell you which 50%. Um, you know, the, your description is vague enough that it could be any of a dozen different things that people have reported. Um, it's all great fun. The thing I love about astronomy is it's a great spectator sport. You know, you don't have to be a quarterback to appreciate football. You don't have to have a PhD to appreciate the cool things you see in the sky. And uh, the best description of cool things that I would recommend anybody who wants to follow up on wonderful stuff in the image behind it and the information behind it is a website called the Astronomy Picture of the Day. And that will get you both gorgeous images and excellent descriptions of what the images mean. So I'd say stick with that. And the poor guy who has to write the article for the newspaper, I mean, he's an expert on taxes one day and astronomy the next day and sports the next day. I used to be a journalist. I know it's an impossible job. So 
we've got a, another. I don't know, maybe two more questions. Two more okay. questions. Uh, so you commented at the uh, beginning, you noted at the beginning of sort of the talk that uh, you made reference to the beginning of sort of a space force being a sixth branch of the military, mm -hmm. and you talked about how you advocated generally for peace in space. Do you feel that um, generally uh, sort of space treaties and general uh, non-militarization of space is in some form of jeopardy between certain countries, such as the U.S., attempting to militarize space, as well as private corporations beginning to stake gains in space, such as SpaceX? It's, it's an issue. The SpaceX one, um, I think they are coming to realize they need to be regulated too, so that everybody else is regulated, so that they can protect their investment. Um, one of the arguments, which is completely valid, is that space is being militarized, whether we accept it or not and other countries are doing military things. But there's a value. There is a real value to hypocrisy. To at least saying that we shouldn't be doing it, even if we are doing it. To at least recognize that what is happening isn't really what ought to be happening. Um, I think there's a value in being able to say that space ought to be uh, for the benefit of all humankind. Even though we know for the next 50 to 100 years it's going to be those who can get there that will be able to exploit it. It's, it's a tricky balance, but it's one that we have experience with. Um, the uh, law of the sea is probably the best example. And a law that in general is you know, followed by every nation because it's to every nation's advantage. And if you can make people recognize that, the more stakeholders you have in space, the more countries that use space, the more people will be willing to invest to make sure that the rules are followed. And so I think ultimately that's the, the way that we can keep space you know, for the benefit of all humankind. Um, <clears throat> can Sagan create the coin, the principle of uh, uh, um, the principle of mediocrity, that the Earth is a just a speck of dust right. in the right. universe. He certainly popularized it. He didn't coin it. Well, he certainly sorry, popularized sorry, sorry. it. Yeah. Then I, I read this phenomenal book, The Privileged Planet, mm -hmm. where it says that if we put together all the conditions that are about right. 15, more than 15, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. can m make uh, life on Earth uh, possible, the likeliness of a planet with life mm -hmm. gets Huge yep. and small, and the thesis, the theme, of the thesis of the book is that not only do we are equipped the planet because of these conditions, but yep. our place in the galaxy is so peculiar that allows us to study the universe. It seems right. that the kind the Creator not only placed life, an in, intelligent life on Earth, mm -hmm. but He placed in a place in the galaxy that, as though He wanted to be known. Mm -hmm. What is your take on this? In science. It's really dangerous to have only two data points, draw a straight line between them, and assume that this linear pattern is true for all of space and time. We know that that kind of extrapolation is really dangerous. When it comes to life in the universe, we only have one point. We can't even draw the straight line. We have no idea how rare or how special life is. We have no idea even what constitutes life and what doesn't. Because so far we only have the one example. So both extremes could be true. The one theological point I bring is it's always dangerous to hang your confidence in the existence of God on some peculiar thing in science because what happens if we got that science wrong, which more often than not we do? Then your faith in God goes away. Your faith in God is not dependent on what science can prove to you. Science doesn't prove anyway. Science describes. And the descriptions are constantly getting better, which is to say they're constantly changing them. Instead, I like to pull back and realize science is a logical system 
where we take in data, apply rules that we think apply to that data, but underlying all of logic are sets of axioms, sets of assumptions. The assumptions of Newtonian physics work really great. Turns out they're not exactly true. The assumptions of Aristotle worked fine for 1,500 years. Turned out they weren't true. The assumptions are what found our understanding of how the universe works in shape. You can prove anything you want by choosing the assumptions carefully. Belief in God and a God who created the universe is a fundamental assumption. If you assume that what we see in the universe is the product of a good God, then you can see evidence of this in many, many places, including the phenomenal chemistry that allows us to have this conversation. Whether we're unique or not, the fact that we do exist is enough to be astonished. But if you don't, if you assume that there is no God, you're not going to see that coincidence. It's not going to be something you recognize. You're going to see something else instead. And it's not that your logic is wrong, it's that your assumptions are different. So it's wonderful as a believer to delight in the beauty and glory of God that you see in creation, and I do that all the time, but I don't do that as a way of saying that proves my assumptions are correct. It does, however, at least show that my assumptions are not incorrect. And it's you know, reassuring in that sense. But the faith has to come first. The faith that the universe really exists, that it does follow laws, that it is ultimately good and made by a good God, even though it's a universe that has volcanoes and earthquakes and, and supernovae. Uh, a universe that can be very, very damaging to life, but a universe that allows life to exist. And by understanding, or at least getting used to this universe, you, in a sense, get used to God. I was, I was talking to students earlier today, and they're complaining that, you know, how hard it is to understand the physics and, and the, the engineering they're learning right now. Of course it's hard to understand. It was hard for me, too. And I quoted to them what I heard from a professor say, you never really understand physics. You just get used to it. <laughs> and I realized, you know, if you're in love with someone, you never understand them. They're not a problem to be solved. There's someone you grow to know over time. And this universe, you'll never understand. You get used to it. And this creator, you get used to. But you only get used to by spending the time to get to know it. And I'm exhausted with that. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. So just very quickly, uh, we're very grateful to, to the John Templeton Foundation for providing support, uh, to Relevant Radio for advertising this. Uh, we had some special guests. Martin Saints Classical High School is here in abundance. Uh, thank you. Also, Montfort Academy in Mount Vernon. Thank you for coming. A long way. You'll also notice there are quite a few people here today, and uh, this event was quite fascinating. And there's someone very important who helped to make this uh, so wonderful. So please thank you, Teresa. Thanks for coming. And thank all of you. Right.